This video is my talk from DockerCon 2017. I actually did it twice, once in the US, once in Europe at both DockerCons. And a lot of this stuff still is relevant today. In fact, there's very little of it that would change if I did it again right now. So this details the best practices starting from hardware decisions all the way up through the OS into Docker versions, into your images, and then building out swarm clusters and how you design those and how big should they be and what should be managers versus workers and all the details in between. So I hope you enjoy. This is the last session of the day. And uh, we've got the, the most excellently awesome Brett Fisher, who is also a captain. Uh, he was one of the, the first cohort of captains, so he's got years of experience of Docker in production. He consults and helps people get to production. And this session is about uh, what you need to know, but also what you need to decide. So it's the decisions you need to make too. Um, if any of you are into... Uh, like, oh, if, you're old, if there are old geeks in the audience, I don't mean that in a nasty way, because I am one real, real old and real geek, then you will, you will enjoy the, the theme of this session. So uh, take it away, Brett. Get a hand of applause, please. Thank you. Whew. I get the honor of having the graveyard shift, so thanks for coming. And uh, we're uh, almost to happy hour. So why are we here? Uh, he uh, lined it up very uh, succinctly, but we are here because you probably want Docker in production. I'm not here to convince you that Docker in production is a good idea. You probably already decided that. So this is about the lessons learned with consulting and with Docker and a lot of their best practices about a lot of the decisions you need to make before you get into production. Also, you might be a, a old video game fan, a retro video game fan, so I'm going to keep you a little bit entertained with some trivia, and I'm going to ask you for, I'm going to give you some uh, music and screenshots from classic games that were my favorites as a kid, and I want you to yell it out if you recognize it, so this is a little bit audience participation, and uh, let's get started. So if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm a geek, and I have been since the fifth grade when I got a TRS-80, and I mostly do sysadmin stuff, although I'm a pretend developer as well for a long time now. And the, here's the list. This is my resume. This is the list of all the video game platforms I had as a child up until like the early 19, uh, 90s. And we're going to have some trivia. So let's have some fun. Anyone? Street Fighter. That was good. He was fast. Hadouken! Okay. So uh, this, is, this is me making poor analogies about 80s video games and how that relates to Docker. So in the 90s, I was actually in Navy A school, and in the, mili uh, in the military, we were learning mainframes as well as PCs at the same time, because let's just do both. We had original hybrid computing. And uh, the cool thing about this game was when you were actually in school, you could actually get all your friends with a oh, Super Nintendo inside the room and play eight, game, eight players at a time in a big tournament battle, and we would declare the winning, uh, the crown champion for the week, and then we would go back to studying um, our PC, PCs and mainframes, and so it was a great time. So I'm here to uh, actually give you super Street Fighter Turbo advice on your project and maybe help you make some decisions. And that first problem is uh, limiting your simultaneous innovation, limiting your simultaneous innovation. So this is my fancy way of saying scope creep, scope creep. So we all know about scope creep in IT projects. Everybody wants everything in the first release. And this is the same with your infrastructure. So there's common problems that I see when I'm starting off with projects. Usually I come in at the point when the uh, client wants Docker, they've heard about orchestration, they want all the things in this fancy orchestration because they've spent 20 years building up their VM infrastructure or 15 years, and they want that exact same thing in the first version of their first container in production. So I'm going to give you some excuses for things that maybe you don't need the very first time you deploy production containers. And one of those things is CI CD, even though if you have that today, you probably don't have to do a lot to get it to work with containers. It's not that big of a deal. All of the CI platforms now kind of support, support containers, so you're good. But if you don't have CI CD today, you don't have to have that for your first container project or even your second container project. Don't make that a requirement and have to build up that infrastructure. Uh, dynamic performance scaling is another big one where people just assume that as soon as you get orchestration, this magically causes all of your nodes and your uh, containers to magically scale up and down. That's not built in, and that probably shouldn't be the very first thing you do because you're going to learn a lot, and you need to have those learnings before you start trying to automatically uh, scale this infrastructure. 
And starting with persistent data is a really big one. Don't make your databases the first thing that you put in a swarm cluster. It's not that it's a bad thing, it's just it's a little harder. Persistent data is a, a harder thing to deal with, and it's also probably not your most agile infrastructure, right? You're probably not upgrading your databases to a new version every month, but you're probably deploying new code every week or every day. Or, and so you're going to get a lot more benefit out of your uh, application code anyway instead of your persistent data. So legacy apps, as we've been saying all week and all year, the MTA program, legacy apps still work too. One of my goals whenever we're working on a project with uh, applications is to not change any code. I would say that the, probably the most common change we make in application code is when there's assumed environment pieces hard-coded into the app, like IP addresses in code. Obviously, we probably know that that's wrong. But I, in older apps, uh, you know, like really old apps, 10-year-old apps, I see a lot of assumptions around specific IPs or host names or certain environment variables that need to be there. And we usually have to pull those out and get those into environment variables. That's really the only code we usually have to change. 12-factor, we all, a lot of you probably have heard of 12-factor. It's sort of an ideal solution. It doesn't need to be there for you to implement containers or even orchestration. It's, I don't look at it as it's done. I look at it more as a horizon. So your goal should be to learn distributed computing best practices and implement those over time, not necessarily uh, all at once before you go to production. And yeah, don't let this stuff delay you because uh, you're going to learn lots on the first day of production. You're going to learn more there than the last two months of the project of going production, right? Okay, okay, yes. So this is the NES in 85. That was a long time ago. But that game, Super Mario Brothers, held the title of the best-selling game on a platform for 30 years. It held that title. And uh, it was a big part of my, it was my first console that actually had uh, two controllers that we could play a game at the same time. So that was me learning how to be competitive in gaming. Before that, a lot of the games are usually just one player at a time. And uh, it also had co-op modes. So that was really cool for uh, learning what co-op's about. So let's talk about some Dockerfile power-ups and how you might make your Docker files better and ready for production. So I always tell everyone, focus on Docker files first. I'd rather you have those Docker files be really well tuned than some fancy orchestration features or fully automated CI CD. Those Docker files are your new build documentation. So you're going to need to move, maybe you have code in Ansible, uh, Salt Stack, Puppet, whatever you need, shell scripts, that stuff that you had before for building your servers, that's in your Docker file now. And you're going to need to comment it and put lots of documentation in that file. And you're going to need to tune that file. And in fact, uh, I call this the Docker maturity model of how you might go about starting from day one of a Docker file to the production ready Docker file, because a lot of things obviously just work in dev and then not in production. And with containers, that's our goal, right? Is that the things that work in dev work exactly the same in production. That was our whole go goal. So we start with just getting your app to work and not crash, which doesn't always work the first day. So as you start this project and you're starting your Docker files and you're basing it on official images, hopefully, you're going to get it to start and stay starting and stay working. Then you're going to focus on your logs, like getting the logs out of that container, not putting them into log files. That's an anti-pattern. And I see a lot of people still doing that. You need to be putting it in STD air and STD out and let Docker handle your logs. Let your, oper your orchestration handle your logs for you. Please don't keep them in the app. And it also removes requirements, because a lot of apps have uh, sub-modules that are doing this fancy logging for them. And now you can kind of pull that out of your app and make that a part of your infrastructure. Then documenting is a big thing to do next. Maybe you're uh, someone who's working on the Docker file for the team. And you're going to need to give this to someone else in the team to have them test it, run it. I recommend you have documentation in there about each area of the Docker file, obviously. Those lines are pulled out before build time, so it's not going to slow down your builds. It's not going to affect production with all the documentation in there. And then making it lean and making it scale. So a lot of people focus on lean first. Like they worry about the size of the image. And I'm here to tell you your image size is not your number one or number two problem. I don't care how big your image is because you're, you're going to probably want to use the, the official images that you're used to. If your servers today are Ubuntu or uh, CentOS or whatever you're running, make those the default images on your first project. 
Now, eventually, you can get to some super lean Alpine images that are 5 meg with only the binaries that you built in Go, and that's all wonderful. But you don't need that on day one. You don't need that in your first container project. I have production clients that don't have that yet, because that image is single instance storage. On those hosts, each image, assuming it's a single version, is only stored once, even if you're running five containers from it. And so it's not a big deal if you have a 500 meg, you know, image or a 300 meg image. So I wouldn't sweat the small stuff like the image size. I would sweat more about the quality of the Docker file and then reducing the change rate. So if your build documentation is all based on apt-get, you don't want to move necessarily on your very first Docker file to a completely different package manager in Alpine. You would rather use the same build documentation you have today. It'll work in the Docker file with apt-get in the Docker file and, and take that to production and learn all the lessons you're going to learn there, and then make a, sub, a separate project later to maybe change to something like Alpine, like a reduced image, a reduced footprint, for, maybe for security or just for leanness of the image. So, and then make it scale, right? And taking that application and running it in multiple containers at the same time, uh, assuming it can, if it's a database, probably needs to have something like replication and all that stuff in the database layer. But if you're talking about web apps or worker apps and stuff like that, uh, make sure that it can scale out. Because it doesn't always mean that just because it runs in one container that it'll work well in an a orchestrator automatically with five containers, right? There might be session state you're dealing with, other issues with uh, parallel. <laughs> Sonic the Hedgehog. Okay, so who remembers the 16-bit console wars? Remember the 8-bit? We went to 16-bit and it was a big deal and there was this fight between Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis and who's going to win? And you know, now we're on the 128-bit wars or I don't know what we're at now. But uh, so Sonic the Hedgehog was such a big deal for me as a kid that I actually, uh, when IRC and uh, I'm going to see everyone remember uh, ICQ chat from the 90s? Yeah. So, so I had to come up with a handle, right? We all, if we all got online, you're like, oh, I'm not supposed to use my real name. I got to have a handle. So I ended up with Sonic's so, vari variations on Sonic the Hedgehog because that was my favorite game at the time. And he was really cool. He actually it was so cool. He had this feature where he would roll up into a ball and scream around the screen. Uh, loop-de-loops -loops all over the screen, and what happened was that you, the player, because I was probably like three frames a second or something crazy slow at the time, uh, you, you as a player were no longer w aware of what was going on the screen. You were really just following anti-patterns, and you were trying to prevent this. You were trying to prevent from hitting spikes or dangers in the road ahead. So the only job you had was to make sure that you didn't hit stuff. You were an anti-pattern um, thing. You were just, a, that's all you were observing. So this is my horrible analogy of how we're going to look at Docker, fi Docker file anti-patterns for a second. And uh, we're going to hammer through these pretty quick. And the first one I see is pretty obvious. We probably all know about volumes now. That's a new, not a new feature. It came out a while back, a couple years. And I see people that accidentally forget to add extra doc, uh, volumes for maybe their debug logs or uh, error dump logs or something like that that they forgot to put to STD out. Or maybe they have uh, static file uploads from users or some sort of caching files that they want to keep between uh, loads of the app or something. So you want to make sure that those are in volumes. If you're using official images, all the persistent data stuff in there already has volumes for you taken care of. If you're using uh, latest, please stop. Just don't, ever. Why? Just never again. Ever type that word latest. Just don't do it. Do a version. Just, if you're going to make a Docker file, even for testing, just get in the habit of typing versions, because it's muscle memory. So when you get to the muscle memory of knowing the version that you're on right now and just typing that in the from lines, uh, you'll see here that the example on the top, the PHP uh, official one uses version number simver, right? The, the second one there from Ubuntu, uh, it's, it's got a, technically it's a simver because it's on 1604, but it's date-based, so you know that the, packet, the app get packages in there when they were actually put in. So it gives you an idea. These are also two examples, by the way, of when you're building your own images. You don't have to do simver of your own images. You might do date-based or commit ID-based. But what I want to really focus on here is that the top example is showing um, the versions of the different apps that I'm putting in that Docker file. And I'm setting up environment variables at the very top so that when someone or anyone on my team looks at this Docker file, they can immediately know what actual versions of those apps are installed. They don't have to scroll through what could be hundreds of lines of Dockerfile to figure out what version of Node that we put in here. Um, I mean, obviously, you have things like pack package JSON and um, Composer and stuff like that. That's a little bit separate because that's in the app. But this is all about those, app, those parts of the app that are there 
just so your code runs. And they tend to get lost in the Docker file and you forget to update them. So in the second one, you can see I'm pinning, actually pinning isn't the right word for apt-get, but I am specifying the, correct, the, the right update version for some of my apt-get packages. Most people don't do this when I, when I first get into the project. And I, it's not hard to do. You actually just can install the versions that you think you need or, or just install whatever's latest and then find out the versions pretty easily with apt-get and then just put those in your Docker file, not for everything, probably not for curl you know, or, or other utilities you might need, but for the ones that are particular to your app. And PHP is one of the uh, harder ones because it usually has a lot of apt-get dependencies for your PHP app. So pin those versions because you don't deploy random versions of code. So why deploy random versions of the code dependencies? This Docker file could be built daily every time you do a code commit, which means you could end up with random image versions of the, of the, of the dependencies. And then if you're doing, start to get the full auto CI CD, you start having random little quirks, like the Mongo database driver gets updated and suddenly doesn't support your version of Mongo, but you didn't know it because your testing doesn't maybe test on that version of Mongo. So anyway, I'm not bitter. It happened to me. I'm just saying, pin your versions. You'll, you can learn from me. Um, default configs in apps like, well, really all apps, but PHP, uh, MySQL, Postgres, Mongo, Java is a pretty good one. A lot of people will not realize uh, or conceptualize the idea that there, this is infrastructure building in the Docker file, and maybe before you were depending upon another team to set up your Java memory limits or set up the proper uh, MySQL config file. Those are now a responsibility of the Docker file, or at least they should be. So this is a pretty good example of what you might do. Um, a better example is if you use an entry point script. I'm not going to get into entry point scripts today or how they work, but they allow you to run a command before you do your CMD that could be a script that sets up your config files on the fly. And if you actually go look at the official images for MySQL or Postgres, to name a few, those have entry point scripts in them that do all sorts of stuff before the database starts. They create the default database. They add the default admin password. They set up a custom user for your database. They do all that, and then the database restarts into the command. And this is a way that you can solve a lot of these problems around not hard coding environment settings into the Docker build. You really want to keep those out and in the actual um, runtime configuration. And so this is something I saw on a project where they were building the same image over and over, different uh, technically images for different environments. So then they would just change the Docker file to use a different JSON and then build a different image. This is definitely an anti-pattern because now you've got all these different images, uh, one per environment. And if, if you've been in this industry long enough, you know, uh, environments are infinite, right? Especially now that we have virtualization. It's, you know, there, whatever you have in environments, t tomorrow it'll be n plus one. And so you'll be keeping all these different images and you don't want that. So you're going to constantly try to be pulling out all those environment settings, setting them ideally in the environment file of a Docker file. I prefer doing it in the Docker file than having it in other files that later get imported because it increases visibility. So I always try to get as many of those environment settings right there in the Docker file as defaults, and then I set them at runtime so that uh, anyone who's looking at the Docker file knows what the defaults are. They don't have to go digging around in some other repo or some other system for whatever that config file might be for that application. Mm. This is a, a little tougher one. We're going to get more advanced. Dragon's Lair, yes. This is a pretty cool one. In fact, it was the first Laserdisc game, and it was in 83. I don't know if anyone remembers a Laserdisc, but it was basically a big CD, a very big CD, the size of a record. And this is hand-drawn um, art. This is actually a game that was playing a movie while you were watching it. In fact, for me, it, most, it mostly looked like that because I was constantly dying. It was a hard game to play, and there was no cheats. You couldn't look up cheats on the internet back then, so you couldn't figure out what the right moves were. So Dragon's Lair. It was, uh, it was actually a 50 cent game when the world was on 25 cents per game. I, I, they were like the one, they, they started this evolution of dollar games and two dollar games and all this crazy stuff now. And we would all just stand around and watch it because it was like, it was like watching a cartoon. And um, it actually, I think it was probably the mo one of the most grossing 
games uh, in a 10-minute period, I would basically lose a paycheck in 10 minutes on this game because you would die every 30 seconds, and it was one life per 50 cents. So it was pretty tough. Um, by the way, 50, uh, 35 years later, this game still looks fantastic. You can actually play it on your phone now, and it looks great. So let's slay some infrastructure dragons. Let's, uh, let's talk about three big decisions that you probably need to make if you're an ops team um, about your infrastructure. It's probably some of the most common questions I get on a start of a project. And the first one is VMs or hardware, like VMs or bare metal. And I say both. I say do what you're good at. Stick with what you're good at. And then maybe on a later project, you uh, do some basic performance testing on bare metal. You're probably better, uh, unless you're uh, a few of us that really need the raw power of bare metal, you're probably better at VMs today than you are at using bare metal and dynamically deploying bare metal. Um, so if you're, if you're on VMs, I would say later do some performance testing on bare metal at scale on that, not necessarily a, a multiple servers, but on that server itself, scaling up the number of containers on that bare metal and seeing what the performance looks like. You can do some really simple stuff with some really simple open source tools. It doesn't have to be complicated or some, some tool you purchase. Um, in fact, at the beginning of the year, it's, a, it's probably still relevant because, <laughs> you know, it, this is the world of containers. At the beginning of this year on 112, I worked with uh, HPE and Docker on, uh, we, we created a white paper, and there's another white paper as well if, on that link, there's two of them, that talk about and actually show some basic performance testing that we did and comparisons of uh, workloads in VMs, workloads in containers in VMs, and then workloads in containers on bare metal. And it's not a tweet. I can't just give you a one-liner that says, this is what you should do. Because it's complex, right? It changes your I.O. patterns. It changes your kernel scheduling. So you're going to probably, as you increase density, uh, the number of containers in a VM, you're going to have to care a little more about things like kernel uh, scheduling and kernel settings and network settings because you're going to be loading up that OS where maybe before you had one app in one OS and then one app in one OS. So it cha just changes the pattern. So you have to learn a little bit uh, as you grow. The next one is about your OS and the distribution. So we're talking about Linux right now. Obviously, if you're, on Win if you're going to do Windows containers, you get one choice. Uh, and that's a nice, easy choice. But if you're on Linux, uh, your distribution doesn't matter as much as your kernel. Uh, the innovations and fixes that, I mean, Docker is a little over four years old now. Containers have uh, actually been affecting the future of the kernel and how the Linux uh, kernel and operating system is created and deployed and all that stuff. So you don't want to be running a five-year-old kernel version. 3.10 is the minimum of Docker. And just because it's the minimum and it works doesn't mean it's the one you should be using, right? I recommend a 4.x kernel. And uh, there's actually still a couple of distributions out there where if you install the latest version, you might get a 3.something kernel. So you need to care about that more than you used to. I mean, Apache works the same way pretty much on every different distribution. Docker does not. Containers do not, right? So... Um, I would say if you don't have an opinion, just try Ubuntu. I, I'm not playing favorites here, but the thing about Ubuntu, if you're not someone who's particularly uh, passionate about a particular uh, distribution, is that it comes with a 4. something kernel out of the box. It has the, t the nice long-term support lifecycle. It's well documented on the internet. Docker tests it heavily. It's one of the official uh, Docker-supported distributions in the Docker store. Or maybe try InfraKit and LinuxKit. Now, this one is a caveat, uh, because this one will delay your project. If you are new to this type of building your own distribution and deploying with, Linux, uh, with InfraKit, if you're not aware of InfraKit, uh, those are extra additive things. So I'm warning you now that that will not be the fastest choice, but it will maybe be cool. Uh, so that will affect the length of your project. It'll delay it a little bit as you learn how LinuxKit works. There's been sessions this week on Linux Kit, and there'll be more tomorrow, I'm sure, at Moby Summit. Lastly there, um, make sure that you get your distribution from the store. The default distribution of Docker in your, like an apt-get, yum, all those, that's not going to be the right version for you. I'm, I'm going to guarantee that, because that, that's probably going to be 113. You know, that's eight months old now, 10 months old. So you want the latest versions of Docker that you can get. The, the, the latest stable is 1709 from last month. And you're going to get that through the store, um, which ensures that Docker built it and that it's not actually different than what Docker intended, which is actually the case with some older distributions and uh, other package managers. Last one here is your container. And we talked about this, uh, your container from image. We talked about this, your base image. 
A lot of teams end up having an intermediate image is what I call it. So you have your base from the store uh, or from uh, Docker Hub. You have your intermediate that's maybe your standard for the team for Node.js, you know, picking your own standard of, no, of that version. And you're going to have some of that. And then you maybe have another image that you build on top of that. You don't have to do it that way. But if you're more than a few people in the team, you probably want to set some standards going along. It's kind of like the old golden image idea of a VM. That's what you're going to maybe do with an intermediate. But um, I would say make it based on not the image size, like I said earlier, definitely based on what your VMs are. If you're used to a particular distribution, just start with that distribution in your image. It'll work. It'll be great. And then you won't have to change everything about your build documentation when you convert over to your Docker file. Um, yeah, matching your existing process. And then maybe later, again, uh, consider Alpine. It is becoming a very popular choice because of its uh, 5 meg size for the image, uh, which is pretty sweet. Warcraft. Job's done. Famous lines like job's done, right? This is actually my intro into Blizzard, and my 20-year love affair with Blizzard started with that game. I was actually lucky enough to be in the beta of the very first version. This was so long ago that you had to buy a sound card and put it in your PC to get it to play, like, or to, to actually enjoy it. And uh, that was, that, you know, the original PC did, was not designed to play video games, I guess, or not, not have at least anything other than a little crappy PC speaker. So, uh, and I, buy, I think I've bought every Blizzard game since then. So, yeah, that worked. Let's talk about swarm architectures now. And this is really about the swarm, layer, uh, the swarm architecture. So we now know the OS. We now know our images. Let's talk about how we're going to build that swarm out. And I'm going to give you some very basic designs. If, you're not, if, if you haven't gone to some of the other swarm uh, stuff, if you haven't uh, read up on swarm and how it works, I'm not going to go deep dive, obviously, into swarm. Uh, we had a great workshop on Monday. Uh, you, there's a session actually before this with Laura Frank that talks about Swarm uh, and the internals of Raft and how consensus works. So I'm just going to give you uh, some basic designs starting with Baby Swarm. And Baby Swarm is one node. You can build a Swarm on one node, which can be your laptop. It's just one liner, right? We probably have all seen these demos. We've probably tried these demos. It's a real thing, and I want to talk about it for a second. It's OK. You have infrastructure today. I'm sure that every one of you, there is one system in your environment that is not highly available that if it went down, you would get a phone call, right? Something, somewhere. It may, it may be a CI system. It may be just like some notification system for your ticket system or some, you know, something that's not critical to your business. But you have that somewhere. So run it on Swarm. Run it on, uh, just do Docker Swarm in it. You get new features out of the box with it. You get secrets, you get configs, you get services that automatically, they're declarative, so they automatically re, uh, will um, replace themselves if they have a problem. They can use health checks to make sure that they're available. Those things you don't get with Docker Run. So out of the box, uh, it works fine. Let's do it. The next option you might have is a three-node swarm. Don't do even numbers, not two-node swarms. Don't do that. Uh, at least for managers. We're talking about the managers. And if you're not super familiar with Swarm, there's two types of machines. There's workers, which get the job done, and there's managers that have the Raft consensus database, kind of like an NCD server. And in this case, you're a very small a project. It's maybe a, a hobby project or a test project. All the machines are doing work, but they're also all managers. So they also um, have a little bit more of a security risk profile because they're storing the Raft database that has all of the control over your Swarm. And that's the very minimum that it will actually provide a fault tolerance in, in your managers. The next size up might be five. This is what I would call the biz swarm, because this is what I recommend to, to small, little, scrappy startup companies, that they just want the minimum infrastructure for high availability, and, they don't, and they don't really, they're not so concerned yet about security and providing boundaries around their managers, and they just want high availability. So I recommend this, because this allows you to take one node down for maintenance and still have a fault tolerance. Because in this one, you can lose two, right? So we got to have always a majority of manager nodes have to be up. So that would be five. From there, we're just going to kind of make it up as we go. And by the way, um, on these boxes, if you're an AWS person, ignore the fact that it says T2 or C2. That, the instance size doesn't matter. It was just the, the graphic program I was using gave me those uh, graphics. So in this case, I've actually split them out. I now have my managers on a sort of a secure enclave, a different uh, VLAN um, or a security group, so that they can all talk amongst themselves and control the swarm. And then I can just make as many worker nodes as I need to have. 
Okay, and those worker nodes can be lots of different things. They can, in one single swarm, I can have different hardware profiles and different network segments, um, different availability zones. I can do all that stuff with those worker nodes and use constraints. If you're not familiar with those, it's basically metadata that allows you to tell a service that you're creating for Docker that it needs to be over here where the SSDs, SSDs are, or maybe there's a, a security profile uh, scanner you run on a particular server for PCI compliance or whatever, right? You make it up. V, uh, VPNs, uh, maybe something's over a VPN. You want to assign labels to those nodes, and then you constrain your work um, with that stuff, with the, uh, the constraints. So we can scale this up all the way to 100 nodes, and it doesn't change a whole lot. It doesn't, it doesn't really change. It's just more worker nodes in more places with more diverse profiles. You're still using the same habits. Maybe the instance sizes are bigger, and you will have to scale your managers because your managers are storing that Raft database in memory. So as the work gets bigger and there's more work to be had, that Raft database will grow, and your, your RAM and CPU profiles on those managers may need to increase. But they're very easy to replace. You can bring one in, take one out with a couple of lines of the Docker file. I'm going to give you a quick little warning on a soapbox that please don't make your cattle pets. Um, a lot of people that are moving to agile infrastructure, and I hate to use that word because agile is always overused, but your, your infrastructure with Docker has the capability of being agile if you don't make it pets. If you don't start a, like downloading Git, uh, you know, Git repositories onto the host and you don't start doing special stuff on the host, it can maintain, if it's just build a server, install Docker, add it to the swarm, and then deploy containers. If you just keep it at that, and you do everything either remotely through the Docker API, or um, maybe some fancy shell stuff where you do stuff over SSH, but you don't actually store stuff on the hard drive, then that node is not special. And it doesn't have to be. Um, but I see a lot of people that end up making like one of the manager nodes their box that they do all this stuff on. They have all these tools, and then they install things with AppGet on the host. And it's a bad habit. It's a habit we've had for decades. It's just a habit you've got to get out of doing. You can do all your troubleshooting and all your testing in containers and in that swarm, and that's great. It keeps it out of being uh, on the host. So reasons you might have um, multiple swarms. This is a common question. Actually, it was also asked in Dan's session before. These are bad reasons for multiple swarms. You can do a lot in a single swarm. There is no hard set limits, right? We've tested thousands of nodes. Docker, I think, has tested tens of, or 10,000 or something. I'm not sure what their, their top number is. But um, these are all things that actually uh, you don't need a reason. You don't need that reason to create multiple swarms. Now, if you have some of these reasons, you, you would have to create potentially multiple swarms. Like, uh, I'm an ops person, so I love the idea of giving the ops team the chance to fail before production. <laughs> so give the, give the opportunity for the ops team to have a, a real swarm that other people care about, like maybe the CI platform or the testing infrastructure. Give the ops person or the team a chance to have that and so that they can learn, they can make mistakes on Swarm and accidentally delete the database off the Swarm or whatever you know that, that people do uh, th before they get all the way to production. Because if this is your first project and this is your first Swarm, you're going to learn lots. You're going to make mistakes. So it's great when you can make them not in production, right? Uh, management boundaries. The Docker API out of the box is an all or nothing thing. And you've probably, if you've used Docker a while, even before Swarm, you know that it doesn't have RBAC built in. It doesn't do that role-based access control out of the box. You can do that with Docker EE. There's other uh, third-party tools. There's actually a plug-in model that you can create off on top of it. But unless you add that layer, uh, it is an all-or-nothing thing. So if you have a team that needs that sort of thing, maybe you just dis decide you know, the New York office is going to have a swarm and the DC office is going to have a swarm because of management boundaries. So. I'm going to throw a real quick slide in about Windows Server 2016 because that is a cool, really new cool thing in Swarm where you can have a hybrid Swarm of different OSs. And I will, um, Windows, it's this year, right? This is the year that is uh, Server 2016 that's made this possible. And it's innovating quickly. So every couple of months, we get a nice new set of features in Windows that uh, expand the capability of it in Swarm and in Docker in general. So I will say that if you want to make a pure Windows Server 2016 Swarm, um, you, there may be some potential negatives of that just because we've had four years of innovation in containers. There's all these open source projects on monitoring and logging, and, but a lot of that stuff is Linux only. So if you're a Windows shop, I would encourage you to consider at least some Linux in your swarm so that you can 
innovate with some of those neat tools out there that in the ecosystem that maybe aren't ready for Windows. They're, they're catching up to Windows, right? Um, also, if you're, uh, um, I'm always license sensitive on Windows, and if your swarm managers are just being swarm managers and that's all they're doing, then maybe make those Linux, and then you'd use Windows for your Windows workloads, and you don't sort of uh, spend a license on Windows just to be a manager sitting there making decisions. So, another, but it, you know, obviously could do that. This is another hard one. X-Wing? Okay. That's a little easier with music, right? Uh, X-Wing was a 1993 uh, DOS game, and it was probably one of the first games that you needed a mouse for, like Wolfenstein 3D was around this time and all that. Uh, it was an actual flight simulator in space. It had, you could fly every Star Wars craft eventually because they had lots of as-ons. This game was an addiction for me for at least a year to the point that I actually got my first store credit at the Navy NEX, which is like the Navy Walmart, um, and bought a, like, Bose speakers to play the fantastic soundtrack, and I bought a stick, uh, a controller for flight, uh, flight stick. I basically spent way too much money that I couldn't even afford it, and I got a store credit. So yay, uh, consumer debt. And that was the fault of that game. So uh, let's uh, talk about outsourcing some parts of your swarm. Maybe you don't need to do everything in-house. Maybe you don't need to innovate everything. So uh, I'm going to say, like, yeah, beware of the not implemented here syndrome. Uh, basically, there's products out there for certain parts. I mean, obviously, there's commercial products for everything. You could just outsource all of this, right? We have the cloud. We have uh, commercial companies. But if you're going to do this yourself, if you want to do Swarm yourself, Docker CE, then maybe there's some good parts out there that um, you can use that are easy to outsource, easy to exchange. When I say outsource, I mean like either a SaaS or a, some commercial product. And um, image registries is a really great comment with that. Market is well-defined, right? There's good players out there. They've been there for years. Log, uh, centralizing your logging and centralizing your monitoring those are obvious, sort of, to me, those are obvious ways you don't have to go use all the open source tools because typically with open source, even though it's awesome, you're usually trading uh, you know, free for convenience, right? So it, there is no truly free. Um, so these will accelerate your project if you need to cut timeline out of your container project for going production. Look at these areas. And there's also, by the way, a great URL for the CNCF. Uh, foundation, they have a pretty cool sort of like a visual diagram of the ecosystem. So if you're not familiar with all the logging players and containers, there's a nice graphic there that'll give you their logos and you can figure out uh, maybe what things you need to consider there. All right, so really quick, we're actually going to talk about tech stacks. And that's why I don't, I don't know what else to call it, but um, you know, this is the building up from the bottom up, what it might look like for you today. Now, obviously, in six months, we might have Kubernetes. We will have Kubernetes as an option. So these slides aren't Kubernetes ready because I'm talking about today. Right? This is what you can do now. So maybe at the very bottom, you're deploying uh, your infrastructure with InfraKit and Terraform. Oh, wrong button. And then your, your, your runtime here is Docker, obviously, if you're using Swarm. Your orchestration is Docker Swarm. Your networking is the built-in overlaying of Docker Swarm. Your storage, maybe you're using Rexray, which is an open source project that orchestrates your, your shared storage amongst your hosts. That's a pretty cool project from Dell EMC. Jenkins, I'm just throwing this in there. This idea of this stack here, though, is this is all the open source. This is pure open source, everything yourself on your own system or on a cloud system that you're deploying. No SaaS here. Um, Docker distribution plus Portis. Portis is an, a GUI on top of the free registry from Docker. So uh, if you just do Docker pull registry, that's Docker's official registry. Maybe you don't want to use Hub or anything else. You just want your own registry. That's what that would be. Uh, for your layer 7 proxy, and if you didn't know, you're going to need one probably. If you're into web, web stuff at all, you're going to need to share port 80 and 443 amongst many containers. That's going to mean you need a reverse proxy or a layer 7 proxy, same thing. And uh, Flow Proxy, actually from Docker, uh, one of the Docker captains, Victor, is a really cool project that uses uh, HA proxy. And then traffic, I think, uh, maybe uses Nginx. That's another popular one. Um, ELK, maybe, uh, for your lo centralized logging. Um, most of you have probably heard of that. That's another one that works with Swarm. Uh, centralized monitoring, maybe Prometheus and Grafana. Prometheus actually controls the monitoring. Grafana is the GUI on top that gives you nice graphs. And then finally up here, uh, Portainer would maybe be a GUI on top of Swarm. 
And um, one last little thing I thought I'd also throw in. If you're into functions as a service, OpenFaz uh, is uh, here this week. Alex is uh, talking about it. You'll see OpenFaz shirts. That runs on top of Swarm, so you can do your own functions as a service on top of that. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly show you what that might look like if you did some of these SaaS products on top. And the bold items are the items that would change. Notice here Docker for AWS and Docker for Azure. I didn't talk about those, but those are Docker's opinions of how you should best run a swarm in those clouds, and they give you templates. The Google Cloud one's in beta right now. You can sign up, I believe, on Docker's website. But the bold ones there are maybe choices you could make for commercial products that would accelerate your deployment by solving problems that you would otherwise have to solve yourself. Lastly here, um, Docker Enterprise Edition. This is what would change if you did Docker EE on top of Docker for Azure or AWS. So Docker for Azure and AWS are free from Docker. I mean, obviously, you got to pay for the infrastructure, but their templates are free. And on top of that, if you did Docker EE, your runtime changes to the official supported EE version, your layer, your layer 7 proxy and your registries and your GUI is taken care of for you. So you can see how this stack is getting very, very Docker-centric and focused. And uh, so the fastest deployment, honestly, is just to deploy Docker EE on Azure or AWS with their templates. So if you needed speed. If you didn't know, uh, also, Docker EE also gives you lots of other things, right? You got the image scanning, the role-based access control, image promotion. We've all seen those demos in the keynote um, and the content trust. Gauntlet. Remember, don't shoot food. Life lessons, don't shoot your food. Uh, this is 1985. This is a hack and slash arcade game that Valkyrie um, needs food badly. That gave you up to four players, right? I'm not talking about this Ready Player One, by the way. You need to watch that movie next year, but you got to read the book or listen to the audiobook by Will Wheaton before that. It's a great trip to, through, through the 80s if you're an 80s fan at all. Valkyrie, your life force is running out. So the cool thing about this game, you could play this as four players or one player, and it still was fun, okay? So just because your friends run around, you couldn't co-op together on this game, doesn't mean you can't play it. And, it wouldn't, and you wouldn't have fun. So the same thing with your orchestrator. Maybe I'm going I'm to like throw all that out and say maybe you need to get containers in, in, in production because the holiday season's coming and you promised your boss containers by Christmas. So what if you can't do container orchestration before then? And maybe you have infrastructure that's fully automated. Maybe you use ASGs and, and Amazon where you're auto-scaling your VMs and you put your apps in the VMs. So I'm just going to argue my own argument and say, maybe you like the boundaries of a VM, so do one, v one container per VM. We don't talk about that really in the industry because it's not the coolest thing, but it totally works. You could um, uh, do this and change less of your infrastructure, it, but it has lots of benefits. It means you can learn how to use Docker files. It means that you learn how to manage Docker in production. And this is one container on that one VM. Obviously, you're not getting scale out of, out of your containers, like all these containers in a single VM. But you're, if you're not doing containers today, then you're already doing this. So this is not worse. This is getting you better, right? It's just not the full-on orchestration. So this actually is happening right now. This is not a new thing. Uh, Windows is doing this with Hyper-V. Hyper-V containers are basically one container in a VM. Linux is doing this with the Intel, Intel Clear Containers Initiative. That's a cool project where they're making, making very minimal Linux OSs. This is also coming um, with... The, um, Linux Kit, well, Linux Kit does this today, but this is actually coming with Linux containers on Windows, which is LCAL, that's the short way of saying that. This is how you're going to be able to run Linux on Windows with very minimal OSs. That's just one container and one VM. So this is happening now. I'm giving you permission in your projects to say, this is a legitimate architecture decision. You can just deploy that one container on that one VM. All right, last one. This is a really hard one. 1983. Doesn't even have sound. All right, Dungeons of Dragorath. Uh, this is actually a 1982 game, runs on the TRS-80, and it was one of the first 3D games. It was, I mean, look at that thing. That was a, ye it was a decade before Wolfenstein 3D. They did not invent 3D gaming. And in fact, a decade before this, was there, there was actually a game that was very similar to that called uh, Maze War 3D. So anyway, this was my intro to being a nerd. This was where I learned basic. You had to learn basic by typing it in every time you boot the computer because there was no way to save it um, back then. So you didn't have, unless you had a tape cassette, that was actually a way you could save it. Um, so anyway, the summary here is trim the optional requirements from your project. Be judicious about getting your project tiny, the first couple of projects. 
focus on your Docker files. If you're doing Swarm, then focus on your Compose files as well. Watch out for your anti-patterns in your Docker files uh, so that they are clean as well as uh, working well. And then stick with the familiar OS and from images that you know. Grow your Swarm as you grow in the project. You don't have to replace Swarms. You can just keep growing them. And lastly, uh, find ways to outsource your plumbing. Oh, that's not last. I lied. And then uh, realize parts of your uh, tech stack may need to change because this is agile infrastructure. So your, best, your first choice may not be your best choice. That's fine. Be OK with that and be willing to change things along the way. And uh, give me feedback on the, in the session app. And thanks for coming.